Okay, so now we are going into our book, back again to our book. We kind of took a little detour last few weeks as we were looking into the pre-tribulational rapture. I think it's pretty clear, right, about the fact that there is a rapture, that church will not go through tribulation, and the Lord is going to remove the church from this earth before he unleashes his wrath on this earth, right? Any questions there? We looked at 2 Thessalonians, we looked at 1 Thessalonians, we looked at church as a mystery, we looked at all these aspects that was focused on a couple of things, is that the Lord has a plan for the church, He has a plan for Israel, right, as a nation. So, He is not mixing both of these up. So, we have to be very clear on that. God has a plan for the church, God has a plan for the nation of Israel, and He is going to fulfill His promise to Abraham. We looked uh, if you remember, we looked at promises given to Abraham. Does anybody remember what was the promises given to Abraham? Pop quiz. No? Yes, very good. And? Blessing to the nations, to the Gentiles. And he was promised many descendants, right? And then, uh, do you remember the promise given to David? Throne will be there forever, right? So, I just want you to point this. Just a, a, I try to avoid getting sidetracked, but sometimes I find something interesting, and, and there we go again. So, if you would turn to the book of, uh, I think it's First Chronicles, yeah. Uh, I think it's the last chapter. Let me get to it real quick, and I'll show you something very interesting. Uh, First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 23. I'll just read it for the sake of time. Now here it's speaking of how David's reign comes to an end and Solomon uh, is, is getting... Uh, anointed, and he is uh, going to reign instead of David. And look at the choice of words here in verse 23 of uh, 1 Chronicles 29. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David his father and prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. That use of phrase is very important. What is the throne of the nation of Israel called as at that moment? The throne of the Lord. So there is something very specific to that usage. And that is where it stops. Beyond that, you don't see that phrase being used. You don't even see that phrase of throne being used. Because from that moment, as the kingdom divides... And as it goes into captivity and since that time, the throne of the Lord is not shown there. It is not, um, it, it's not revealed till we now come into the chapter that we are reading in the book of Revelation, where we see the throne and the picture of the rightful heir to the throne, Right? So in the Old Testament, you have the throne, you have the throne of Jehovah being shown, and then we move all the way down to the book of Revelation, where the throne of the Lord is shown again. But at this time, the rightful heir to that throne is on the throne. Make sense? Right? Okay. So let's begin our reading now in chapter 4 of Revelation. Uh, the lesson that we have covers chapter 4, 5, and 6, and I would like to kind of move a bit ahead here because otherwise we'll just never move forward. So I would like to cover uh, lesson number 5 here, that is a sealed scroll. We will just uh, point out a few key things, um, and we can get into really the great depths 
of meaning of everything, but I think we need to uh, read this book and keep ourselves focused to this book. I think that would be beneficial. So if someone could volunteer uh, to read chapter 4 and verses 1 to... Um, one to four. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardius stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Thank you, brother. So here we get into the next phase of this book, right? So we, we just finished the first three chapters. We understand now that the church has been raptured. And if you can consider this as another proof in chapter 4, it starts with the phrase, after these things, right? So there is a succession of events, right? So the first three chapters is talking about something, those are the messages uh, to the seven churches, and then John says, after these things. So he has seen something, and now he is going to see something else. And not only that, the first three chapters, uh, the location of the vision of the first three chapters is different than the location for the rest of the chapters, right? So in the first three chapters, where is... John. Well, physically, he is always in the same place, but where is he uh, in his thoughts? He is in the island of Patmos, right? But when you come to chapter 4, his spiritual location changes. He is no longer looking around on earth. He has now changed his location, and he is looking down from heaven to earth, right? Make sense? So, now he says, after these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And now, I think most of our Bibles, if you have a Bible that puts the words of Christ in red, uh, you would see that uh, was, I mean, uh, chapter 1, 2, and 3, or, you know, parts of chapter 1 and chapter 2 and 3 are all in red, right? But when you come here uh, to chapter 4, uh, depending on what kind of Bible you hold in your hands, it may not be in red because, you know, various uh, teachers kind of argue about who is speaking. But if you look at it, pay a little bit of attention there. It says, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me. So what is that first voice? That should take us back to the first voice, right? So what was the first voice? Where did, and whose voice and where did John hear the first voice? Where was that? In chapter 1? Look at verse 10 and 11. Could somebody read that? Could you also read verse 10? I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice, and it was a trumpet, saying, and I'll say no more than the Okay, so the first voice that came to him like a trumpet was whose voice? Lord. The Lord's voice, right? So in Chapter 1, verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice, as of a trumpet, okay, 
That is not the trumpet sounding, but he is likening it. It is so loud. It is our house. We have a trumpet player. <laughs> and you cannot imagine the agony. You, you, you don't understand it. If, if you don't have a band player at home, it's, it's difficult to understand. That sound is loud. And that is what John is hearing, is a very loud voice. And it's to him, sounds like a trumpet. That's all he can compare it to. So he says, I hear this loud voice, and it is the Lord. So if you were to now turn back to, or turn forward to chapter 4, we can very well understand that voice in chapter 4 is whose voice then? The Lord's, the Lord's right? So even if your Bible doesn't have that as read, that is, it, it's immaterial at that point because it's very clear to us that that is actually the Lord's voice calling him. Now, he gets called up to the heavens, and immediately I was in the spirit, John says, and behold, a throne set in heaven. Now, we get the picture of the throne back. The throne of Jehovah is back, right? And he gets this vision of the throne. In the Old Testament, there are a few people who got the vision of the throne. Who are those people? Ezekiel, Isaiah, right? And then Daniel, right? Daniel gets a vision of the Lord as well. So these are the people who kind of looked up and he, they were able to see the glory of the Lord. They were able to see, and I don't want to spend too much time there. As I said, I'm just kind of trying to move through pretty quick here. And then verse 4, and if you, uh, there is a lot of similarity uh, between um, what Ezekiel sees and what John sees, right? Ezekiel looks at the throne, and if you look at verse 3, he says, He who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne. I think Ezekiel, in his vision um, in chapter 1, uh, in chapter 1 of Ezekiel and verse 28, and Ezekiel looks up to the same throne and he says um, in verse 28 of Ezekiel chapter 1, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So, like Ezekiel, John is viewing what? The glory of the Lord. He is looking at God and, and he looks at it. And all these men who describe to us the glory of the Lord are trying to use similar words and similar phrases and things that we perceive to describe. But we have to remember one thing. These are just descriptions that can make sense to us, but that is not the reality of the glory of the Lord. It is all of these men, when they write, they're saying, it was like, it was like, it was like the rainbow, it was like jasper, it was like sardius stone. That doesn't mean that is the exact vision, it is just so overwhelming for them. What they are seeing is beyond understanding, and they are trying to use things that they can, they can understand so that the audience kind of has a picture of what it would look like. So Ezekiel says, it was like the appearance of the rainbow. So that doesn't mean, you know, make a mental picture that there's this rainbow behind the throne of God. That's not what the picture is. For Ezekiel, it was like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. So it is a very beautiful, comforting appearance. So for Ezekiel the priest, who only identifies God in the temple, for Ezekiel the priest, who cannot understand why would God be outside the temple, for him it was like, ah, it is like a rainbow in a cloudy day. Right? Make sense? Okay. Now, we come to the next thing that a lot of people talk about in verse 4. Now, around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold 
on the heads. Now, who are these 24 elders, right? Um, we can split hairs on this one and try to figure out who are these 24 elders. Various thoughts that are out there. Um, some people say, okay, well, 12 tribes and 12 uh, apostles make 24, so this is speaking about the saints from the Old Testament and the saints from the New Testament all coming together, uh, or the 12 tribes and the, and the New Testament saints coming together, all mashed up, so that's 24. Now, you may say that it is the 12, the representation of the nation of Israel, the saved out of the nation of Israel, and the saved out of the other nations, but what we cannot say at all is this is representing that Israel and church has become one and we are all together in it, but that's the wrong way. See, one of the very important things for us to understand and keep in mind in all our interpretation of the scripture is that God has a plan for Israel and he does not replace the church or he does not replace Israel with the church. He is not doing that. His plan for Israel stands because he is a covenant-keeping God. See, we, when we interpret scriptures, we have to interpret in the understanding of an unchangeable God, right? The other day, I think yesterday, when we were talking about various things while we were doing the packages, one of the things that Brother Thumpy brought up is if you look at various church denominations, you see that over the years, they have changed their thought process or their interpretation, right? They keep changing. They say, oh, well, you know, many years ago, we, we didn't uh, allow the women to do some things, and now we do because times have changed. Or many years ago, we, we expected these things from our members, now we don't because times have changed, right? But that is not how we should interpret Scripture. Scripture should be interpreted in light of an unchangeable God. So coming back here, one thing that is absolutely not there is that this is not showing that God has mashed church and Israel together and they are one. Yes, we are one in Christ, but God has a separate plan for Israel. Make sense? Any questions? No? Okay. Then the other thought process that a lot of people ascribe to is these are angels. Now, they are not angels. Why? Because... These people have what on them? Crowns. Crowns. And then? White robes. Now, if you look at it, those are all pictures throughout the rest of this book. They are all associated with what kind of people? Hmm? Redeemed, souls. redeemed souls. They are associated with people who have been redeemed. They are associated with people who have been victors. So, the crown, there are, there are two particular words that are used in the book of Revelation to uh, talk about crown, right? One is diadema, diadem, right? The crown of glory, the crown of kingship, the crown of authority, of government. And then there is Stephanos, that is the crown of victory, the crown given to a champion, the crown given to someone who just won a race, right? And we have to differentiate. Here, these 24 people have on them the crown of victory, Stephanos. They don't have the crown of glory or government on them. Okay? So they cannot be angels because of what? Their robe and their crown. Their robe is a white robe given which is associated constantly through the rest of this book with what? church or people who are victors, who are redeemed, right? Not necessarily always of the church. These are people who have been redeemed. And then further down in, in, in a few verse in chapters, we will see these people singing the song of the redeemed. Redemption is not a concept given to the angels, right? That is not something for the angels. That is for the people who dwell on earth. That is what God has planned. So that is why we can be very sure to say that these are not angels. So then who are these people, right? Now, we have to kind of now start looking at numbers, right? How are these numbers? Now, numbers are very important in the book of Revelation. So where do we see 24 again? You have to go to 
the book of First Chronicles again in the Old Testament to understand how this is done. If you go to First Chronicles 24, First Chronicles 24. Now we don't need to read through the whole chapter, but what is happening here is David is setting up the priestly ministry, okay? And the way David sets it up is he takes the, the descendants of the two sons of Aaron. So Aaron had four sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. Nadab and Abihu, they died, right? Because they had offered a wrong sacrifice to the Lord, and they were killed. So there are two living sons who had children. That was Eliezer and Ithamar. And David takes these descendants of these priests and divides them into 24 representative groups. Okay, he takes, um, I think he takes uh, 16 from one household and then 8 from the other in verse 4 of chapter 24, if you are in First Chronicles 24. And he takes um, 16 from one, and he takes eight from the other. And then from verse 6 onwards, you will see the, the lots of how they are organized. And you would come down to verse uh, 18, and you would see that the 24th group was Messiah. And they have a schedule. So these are 24 specific people, right? These are name of men. These are 24 men who are representing the priesthood in front of the Lord in their order. So in the Old Testament, we have a picture of these 24 people representing a worshiping group of people. Okay? Make sense? And so we can take that picture to understand what we see in the book of Revelation as these 24 people, as these 24 elders. Now, in the New Testament, you see Zechariah, the husband of, um, uh, uh, you know, the father of John the Baptist, sorry, and, and he uh, goes into the temple because the lot fell on him to go, right? So there is the picture of that same order that David had put together, the 24 men in their order, serving every year in the temple. Zechariah was one of the priests, so he gets to go into the temple according to his lot, right? So you can see that that same order that David set is still being followed, so that picture and understanding of 24 representatives representing the worshiping um, people in front of the Lord is still in existence as we come into the time that this book was written. So, that is a very good understanding, I believe, of us trying to understand who these 24 elders are. They can be taken as representing the redeemed people before the Lord, right? And it can be also understood, you, you have some backing there, because if you were to look at the seven churches, right? Now, there were not only seven churches, but these seven churches are what we consider as representation, right? The seven candlesticks, representation again, right? So you are use, we are already using that concept of interpretation. Make sense? We are already using the concept of interpretation of representation. So we take that same concept of interpretation, and here we use that for these 24 elders. Make sense? All right, moving on. I know we are not going to cover this whole thing. Anyway, um, so then we move on in this portion. This is like three, three huge chapters in one lesson. It's going to be difficult. But um, let's see where we get to. Okay, then you have the 24 elders, and they are singing. And then in chapter 5, we have... Uh, the lamp with the scroll, right? Now, again, something I want us to look at. And, you know, obviously there is, you know, the right hand on him who sat on the throne, a scroll um, sealed with 
seven seals. Um, what, how are these sealed, right? People have gone into fantastic ideas again on how these are sealed. We don't know. We don't know. There are things in the, in the book of Revelation we don't know, and we need to be comfortable with saying we don't know, right? So we don't know how these are sealed, but there is some sort of a seal that is being put in so everything cannot be revealed at the same time, okay? So these seals are revealing because one seal gets opened and something is revealed. The second seal gets opened and something is revealed. And this is a scroll that's written on both sides, okay? What I did to understand really is I looked at the Dead Sea Scrolls, pictures of Dead Sea Scrolls, because that is the closest we have of having a modern picture of what scrolls look like. So if you go home and you want to look at it, just go to Google and search up pictures of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you will see how these were found. Okay, They were just rolled up sheets of parchments or papyrus, different things that they were written on. They were written on both sides. They were rolled up, and they were just sealed and put in, in jars, in clay pots. So this is something like that, something that's sealed, but it is a progressive seal on a scroll. And as, as they open it up, there's another seal, and it opens up and another seal. And then I think in this book itself, there is a, a kind of a sketch that William McDonald put. And that is basically, you've got the seals, you've got the seventh seal, which contains the seven trumpets. You have the seventh trumpet that contains the seven vials. So it is like a progressive, um, successive turn of events. Okay? Now, then there is this cry in heavens on trying to find who is able to take the scroll. And then verse 5 of chapter 5. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals. Now that should catch our attention there because there is no mention. We obviously know that this is Christ, but there is no mention of Christ and his association with the church here. What is Christ associated as? In this verse, what are the titles given to him? The Lion of the Tribe of Judah, the of of Judah and then David. Root of David. It is a very Jewish connection that is being made, right? And that should tell us the context, and that should tell us the idea of the rest of this book. It is no longer Christ, the head of the body. I mean, Paul uses that phrase very well, right? He is no longer our head. He is no longer our bridegroom. He is no longer our chief shepherd. That is not the picture that is, he is, but that is not the picture that is being shown here. The picture that is being shown here is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the root of David. He is now shown as the promised Messiah. So that sets the stage for us to understand the rest of the book as very specific in God's dealing with the nation of Israel and the rest of the nations. Okay? So, then, uh, then there is a song of the people who sing about um, the Lamb and they sing about um, the worthiness of the Lamb to take the scroll. And then we come into the seals. Okay? In chapter 6, we have uh, the six seals, and then in chapter 7, uh, there is a, a kind of a pause where we see a couple of events happening, and we'll get to that in detail. But in chapter 6, the Lamb, that is Christ, starts opening up these seals, right? And the first one, when he, I saw when the Lamb opened, I mean, chapter 6 was 1, now I saw when the Lamb opened up, opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I think we talked about it last Sunday where uh, some of the translations would not use the phrase come and see. It would use the word just come. And that would be the right rendition of the original translation because it is not 
a, a call to John to come and see. John is already up in heaven. He doesn't need to come and see anything. He is there seeing already. So it is not a call to John to come and see, but it is a call for whatever event or whatever person is coming out to come. Because that is very important for us to understand is because we need to know that the person in control of events is still God himself. See, the book of Revelation is not about God just saying, okay, Satan, go ahead, do whatever you need to do, and then at the end of seven years, we are going to go for a war, and I'm going to subdue you. That is not how it works, okay? The book of Revelation and all the events, the seven uh, seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials, are completely in control by the Lord. Does it make sense? We have to understand. You see, there are a few things that we have to be, we may not be able to grasp everything in this book. We may not be able to uh, be dogmatic about everything that's in this book. We may not be able to uh, completely understand this book, but we have to understand a few key things. One is, as we talked about, that the Lord is dealing with the nation of Israel here, and we need to make sure we understand that and stand by it. The church is no longer there on earth. It, the church is with Christ in heaven, witnessing just like John is. And the second thing is God is in control of everything. He has not let go of his control on the events happening on earth, but he is the one who is letting each of these things happen in its own due time. Make sense? So here, that is why the call is to come. And then I looked and behold, I'm in verse 2 of chapter 6, and I looked and behold a white horse. He, he, he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. Again, not a diadem, but a Stephanos was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. So who is this person on a white horse? Hmm? Antichrist, the person who comes out is a person who is everything that is not Christ. Now, then in the second seal, there is another call to come, and the second horse comes, which is fiery red, went out, and it was granted to one who sat on it to take peace from earth. So the first one is not a war, right? This person is conquering, but what does he have as a weapon? Bow, no arrows. So this is a person who is conquering not with power, not with a war, but with words. This is a person who is able to enamor the world uh, into accepting this person. Okay. Now, the second seal is something different. The second seal, this person that comes out, takes away peace from the earth. It is all about war. There is violence, right? So the first person is able to deceive the world into accepting him as the promised Messiah. And right behind him comes this other person who now takes away the peace from the earth. And there is wars and this deception. People have been grabbed into this deception and they have been deceived. And now there is war. And then the third one, the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see, or, or come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And there you have in verse 6, um, famine. Things are very expensive, and how expensive is it? A quart of wheat for a denarius. Denarius is one day's wages. So a person may work for a whole day only to get a loaf of bread. Now, we may have seen pictures of many other countries. I know we've, we've seen pictures in, in, you know, during the, uh, the last depression of how people stood in line, you know, getting, just trying to get a loaf of bread. It's going to be worse than that. It's going to be very expensive. One day's worth of work to get this one small loaf, a quart of, of bread, and that doesn't even feed a family. So it's going to be very difficult for these people. And you may get a little bit more in barley, but then oil and wine, you don't, have, you don't have any sides, right? You just get your bread. So it is a time of famine. And then we have the fourth seal. And then widespread death 
uh, that happens, a pale horse. Maybe we'll cover it next time. And it is a time of death. So this is the time of deception. So chapter 6 describes the first three and a half years of the seven-year tribulational period. Okay, we'll get to that in, in detail. But understand this, that these events, these six seals that are being opened, describe the first um, three and a half years. And how would this first three and a half years look? First three and a half years is a time of deception for the nation of Israel. And this person, this Antichrist who comes, comes as a peacemaker, promising the Israelites uh, the temple. So at this point, the Israelites don't have a temple. They will be promised to build a temple, and they start that work in earnest. The Israelites are being deceived, but it is also a time of severe persecution for anybody who calls on the name of the Lord. And there is a, a great uh, presentation of gospel, and to understand that, we'll get into Matthew chapter 24. Maybe next time we'll pay some more attention there that there is going to be a great proclamation of the gospel of kingdom that happens at that time. And whoever this Antichrist is will sound very pro-Israel, but at the same time is going to be Antichrist. So there is going to be a severe persecution of those who put their trust in Christ. There will be a lot of martyrs. There will be a lot of people who will be killed for their faith. But at the same time, the nation of Israel would be looking up to this person as their Messiah because he has just promised them the temple. And they start the work. And at the middle of that seven-year period is when the Israelites recognize that they have been following the false Messiah. And they would look up and, they, and, and, their, and their work would be stopped midway. And, 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 and we get into, we'll get into that in detail as Christ himself shows how that transition takes place as um, Antichrist then forces his own image to be worshipped instead of the Lord, okay? So just some takeaways from our uh, understanding today. If you don't mind, just go through this lesson. We will cover uh, this lesson. I would like to close this lesson out next time. So go through this lesson. Something that really caught my attention is William McDonald wrote this book in, I think, in the beginning, it says 1961, okay? He wrote this book in 1961. Go to the fourth seal and read his statement. I'll just read that out verbatim, okay? The fourth seal is when the pale horse comes. There is death. And then he says here, we might think that pestilences and plagues are no longer a threat because of modern antibiotics and wonder drugs. Actually, the great killer diseases are not conquered, but merely dormant. They can spread throughout the world as fast as jet aircraft will take them. I was amazed when I read it. I, I kind of had my goosebumps moment at that time because this brother, he wrote it in 1961. Now tell me he was not being directed by the Spirit because what he wrote is so true, isn't it? We are living in a world where we're seeing it. The, the way anything can get on is as fast as a jet aircraft will take it. And that is exactly what we saw even during this weekend, right? This new variant that has come now. As fast as an aircraft could take it from South, Af South Africa to anywhere else. See? That is the world we are living in. I mean, the book of Revelation is a greatly rewarding book today, especially when we study. It is, it is a chilling book, but it's amazing. Because it tells us that the world is being prepared, right? Let's pray. Precious Lord our Father, we thank you for this morning time. Thank you for your word. It is so true. Father, it is so amazing to look at your scripture portions and to see how you're moving the world, Father. Even as we look in the world around us, we're living in a time of pandemic. We're looking at at uh, a virus we, none of us have seen with our own eyes, Father. We, we do not know, but the world is running away. And Father, what an amazing thing when we look at the scriptures and we realize all these things have been spoken. And Father, this is nothing compared to what is coming. And we recognize, Father, that the world is going to be so helpless, hopeless, and Father, help us as believers that today as, as there is still light, 
as the trumpet has not yet sounded, that we may get busy going to our neighbors, going to our friends, our family members, get busy pulling people out of the state that they would be in, in prayerfully a few more years. We pray, Father, that you may guide our hearts. Come with the rest of the morning into your hand. Guide us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.